This is MSQMG. Today, I'm reading from the book, Dysfunctopia, available as an e-book at Barnes & Noble and other sites. It is about a dystopian future with quantum computers. Keep in mind it is a fiction book. Prologue. After the infamous year 2026, the year when an unexpected asteroid was believed to be headed towards the Earth, the USA miraculously rehabilitated from its intoxication with mindless consumption of unessential products coming from docile countries. The near-death experience of the great northern nation unleashed its dormant power and transformed it into hyperactive, isolated, and distrustful being. The outcome of the big asteroid scare resulted in the creation of Promethean technology, phalanxes around its borders, and selfish obsessive vigilance against natural omens. The government of USA accomplished these radical changes by means of an apparent rejuvenated democracy which in reality was a non-consensual resolution that had emerged from the USA's temporary disturbed state of mind. The new technology developed by the renewed USA after the year 2026 ultimately became institutionalized in many aspects of society. Schools did not need human teachers. Restaurants had automated quality services without human waiters. Electronic devices could perform delicate medical procedures better than human doctors. Bullet trains were built in many cities and transported passengers without the need of human operators. Personal, affordable, and efficient flying vehicles, which could almost operate themselves, were available to wealthy individuals. Omnidirectional spherical screen televisions were a reality. People wore fashionable temperature regulating suits which could regulate interior temperature by itself. Most of the technological innovations after the year 2026 were the result of the diminution of computer components whose dimensions became the size of atoms. The low energy required by the atomic components of computers made possible for the laws of quantum mechanics to replace classical mechanics from computers for. The neocomputers were called functionatons whose components could perform multiple operations simultaneously by entanglement of quantum states 5. A functionaton could sometimes be like a thousand classical computers working together in the same space, where only one of those computers could be known at any one time 6. As a result, the intelligence of computers became comparable to human intelligence, leading ultimately to the unwilling replacement of accomplished workers from many mechanized jobs, making many of those displaced workers accept being perpetually dependent on superfluous federal government employment which consisted mainly in the creation of functionatons. Many people found career contentment after the introduction of the new imposed technology and cleverly adapted to an environment plagued by functionatons. However, a few others were not satisfied with USA's progress, making them feel alienated and revengeful. By the year 2054, functio vandalism was beginning. Asterisk asterisk chapter I asterisk asterisk. It was the month of January of the seemingly glorious year 2054. Baron Cortez, an intellectual 16-year-old teenager that lived in the depressed south part of Truxes, in the state of California, woke up early for some strange reason. He looked at the picturesque 3D image of the time being projected by the 3D clock projector on the ceiling and realized that he had woken up 40 minutes earlier than usual. As a result, he decided to take his morning shower earlier than usual. After the brief shower, as soon as the drying machine finished evaporating all the water on the surface of his light brown skin, he dressed up with one of the many elegant, practical temperature regulating suits TRS in the bathroom closet. In order not to get weary from waiting for his, the abhorrent, school instruction to begin, he headed back to his comfortable bed, lay on his left side, put his head on the pillow, and turned on the spherical function at T. 
SFTV. SFTV by a plain voice command The SFTV was a device that allowed viewers to watch the same vivid image in every direction. Baron closed his tired eyes. Then, in order to select an interesting functio show, over enunciating, he said to the device, select T. These shows. Intelligent type, the vivid omnidirectional spherical screen showed promptly the selection of cerebral functio shows that were appropriate for brainy teenagers. Because his soft pillow on the bed was caressing his left cheek, the SFTV automatically adjusted the images to Baron's head posture using its ocular detection functionat and ODF basically, an intelligent device that recorded and analyzed images. Once the projection on the 3D screen was set according to his head posture, the SFTV said, adjustment completed, and Baron opened his somnolent eyes. He scanned through all the appealing titles projected on the 3D spherical screen, 3DSS, and serendipitously selected the one that got his attention by saying out loud the title, not knowing that the act would ultimately change the course of his life, a look at FUNCTIO vandalism around the world. Quote, Soon after having said the title of the Functio show, two men in gray suits seating on couches came out on the 3D screen, and the inquisitive host of the show began to talk. Good morning. Today we have a guest on the show. We are pleased to have Drive. Joshua Smith from University of Hamilton to talk about Functio vandalism. Professor, tell us, what is Functio vandalism? Yes. Functio vandalism is defined as a deliberate sabotage on any functionat and with the intention to alarm, annoy or disturb the human population in order to force the government to advance a particular political view. Quote, is there substantial functio vandalism around the world? Yes, we are beginning to observe a considerable increase in the number of functio vandal assaults around the world. In Latin America, for instance, there have been 232 incidents reported. Quote, how do they vandalize functionatins? They vandalize functionatins in many ways. In Mexico, for instance, groups of individuals break into private properties and destroy with sticks the devices. In other places, such as Colombia, they usually set places on fire. Quote, now, you wrote a book where you explain the reasons for the rising number of functio assaults. Briefly, what are the causes? Well, there are a variety of causes. The main reason is the quick changes in technology that have been taking place around the world since the year 2026. The introduction of new technologies in underdeveloped nations is replacing drastically many workers who have no formal school education due to the impoverished conditions in many of those underdeveloped nations. As a result, many are starving to death when they are not owners of land where they could perform old-fashioned farming. Consequently, middle-class groups in those underdeveloped nations, out of concern for their poor countryman, are creating vandal cells whose only goal is to assault the new technologies that are being introduced so that their governments stop making deal with the main providers of those technologies. Quote, I see. What countries are providing the new technologies? Mainly the USA is providing the new technologies. Quote, what kind of technology is exported to these countries? The main USA exports are functionatins. For those viewers that do not know the exact definition of a functionatin, it is as a device that performs useful and complex functions for human beings based on the given input. Private USA's companies under the guidance of USA's government send engineer to many underdeveloped countries to find out what are some essential complex functions in different aspects of their societies that could be performed better by a device. Based on their findings, the companies create inexpensive functionatins. Then, they send negotiators that persuade their government or small businesses in that country to purchase the devices.
Usually, the negotiators succeed in making deals with the government or businesses, however, like I mentioned, the more impoverished people from that country suffer the consequences and they do not have enough representational power in their imperfect democracies. Wild Drive Joshua Smith kept talking. Barron was comparing the illuminating lecture with a story told by his deceased grandfather who was brought to the USA in 1984. Listening to the erudite professor, Barron was remembering sporadic episodes of the Odyssey that his grandfather used to tell him about the extraordinary way Barron's great-grandfather brought his grandfather from a little town in El Salvador by crossing the Mexico and USA borders without documentation, settling by Massey, California, where both had to resign to enslave themselves in the blistering grape fields under treacherous conditions. Barron's grandfather told him that Barron's great-grandfather had to find work somewhere else for fear of losing their lives after the war in El Salvador had exploded. The rebels and the army of El Salvador fought a bloody battle in and around their property killing Barron's great-grandmother. Barron's grandfather who was 11 years of age recalled the USA military presence in his little amiable town and how they were providing the atrocious army of El Salvador weapons 7 under the pressure of USA government 8. Those weapons given to the Salvadorian army had the unintended effect of killing Barron's great-grandmother when she was milking a cow. Barron's grandfather had been blaming the USA military for the conflict in El Salvador because the conflict had been a result of providing the tools of war. He used to say that if those, devils of destruction, had not showed up at all in his country, the civil conflict would not have been as deadly. Although there were only a few similarities in Dr. Joshua Smith's lecture and his grandfather's story, Barron could not help interpreting Drive. Joshua Smith's exposition on functio vandalism is a recurrent working class plight, where instead of destructive weapons, the USA had been exporting malevolent functionatins, whose introduction into their societies were having injurious effects on the working class of those countries, who were now beginning to bitterly retaliate against USA specialized technology. In Barron's opinion, functionatins distributed around the world were not the cause of the deadly internal conflicts, Functionatins were the unmistakable cause of the annihilation of the human spirit. Barron continued watching the news show thinking about the effects of omnipotent technology on the powerless working class in the USA. His prolific mind was scintillating with ideas while Professor Joshua Smith was eloquently talking about what was going on in other countries. Two of the questions that went through Barron's head were, is there any kind functio vandalism in USA? Did the government censor the speech of the professor? He shrewdly noticed that nobody in the show had been mentioning any kind of functio vandalism being committed in the USA even though there were occasional news flashes about some virus affecting functionatins. However, dismissing the latter thoughts as a mild manifestation of quasi-paranoia, Barron decided to hold in his mind that they were not mentioning any kind of functio vandalism in the USA because usually any kind of functio virus was annihilated immediately, and not much harm was done to the functionatins that had been infected. His brother, who made his leaving repairing functionatins, had told him how easy it was to disinfect a virus from house functionatins. He told him that functionatins were almost antivirus. On the other hand, for just a brief moment, feeling a slave of iniquitous technology and identifying himself as part of an oppressed class, Barron felt that he could sympathize with those peasants and vitriolic middle-class individuals that had bellicosely reacted by the unwanted introduction of abominable functionatins in those countries. 
Baron had been feeling a collateral victim of nefarious technology every time he had to be in front of a wicked functionaden to be able to learn dull useless academic material this form of meaningless academic learning by means of a functionaden called functio school fs was going to begin in 3 minutes he turned off the sftv by saying in a desperate tone of voice turn off and rolled to the edge of the bed then he put his feet on the tiled floor pushed himself off the bed with the help of his arms and dashed towards the omnipotent functionaden which was about 9 feet from his bed where he was going to be logged on into functio school fs by the omniscient ocular detection functionaden odf and the voice recognition system brs connected to the device in just a few minutes the functionaden that he used for his fs looked like a dark metal sphere Two feet in diameter, which had small flickering lights and colorful buttons. There was a pair of functio goggles, which were used to give students the virtual image of a teacher at nine. Also, there was next to the functionaden a pair of gloves, which made interaction with functio images easier. and could give the sensation of objects 10 it was not always necessary to use the gloves for all lessons given that the functionaden was intelligent enough to recognize human hands by means of the odf the gloves were only necessary for hands on virtual activities this functionaden was called local education functionaden lef in order to receive california standards base education 11 the lef was connected wirelessly with the central education functionaden cef of the state of california which provided the individualized instruction for the day it was mandatory for all teenagers to be logged on into their functio classes before 7:30 a.m. monday through friday Baron quickly examined the black and yellow TRS he was wearing to make sure there were no noticeable stains while he was sitting on a chair next to the functionaden. He had to be presentable given that the omniscient ODF on the functionaden could detect the presence of inappropriate school attire. Not only the functionaden made judgments about the images obtained by the ODF but also the images were sent to the educational office of trucks so that the security officers could scrutinize the images quickly security officers had to check thousands of images a day to make sure students were in their houses after baron waited for about 2 minutes a green light on the functionaden turned on indicating that it was time to begin immediately he put on his functio goggles and gloves It was 7:30 a.m. and Baron was ready to begin. He was already wearing his uncomfortable functio goggles and gloves. He was waiting for routine information with his eyes wide open. The light on top of the ODF was turned on, indicating that it was recording his image and checking his presence in the room. While Baron was waiting for the finicky LEF to detect his presence in the room, he was listening to the distinctive sound coming out of the security vehicles patrolling on the solitary street, making sure the teenagers stayed in their houses. Baron could hear a security officer with a deep voice saying, "By means of a megaphone, time to begin." Then the message satellite. checks was projected on the goggles indicating that the world identification functionaden wif on his right wrist had detected his presence in the room via satellite it was a device that could identify him and locate him anywhere in the world after the satellite check the message blood quality was projected underneath the first one which meant that baron was healthy enough to begin his education He was also wearing a blood monitor functionaden BMF on his left wrist which made sure he was eating nutritious food and monitoring his health. After his blood quality was meticulously checked, 
Baron waited. There were two more dull checks that had to be done by the educational functionaden before Baron could start his first class. One of the two checks was to inspect the content of food in the refrigerator to make sure there was going to be a healthy meal during lunchtime pursuant to the criminal code. The second thing that the educational functionaden had to check was the air quality in the house via the smell detector functionadens in every room of the house. At exactly 7.35 a.m., a message appeared, check completed. Baron was reluctantly going to start his first and most detestable class, physics. In order to have access to the tedious instruction itself, he now had to register by entering his password via the voice recognition system, VRS, attached to the functionaden and waited patiently again to get confirmation to continue. Once the match of the voice just obtained by the VRS, and the government recorded voice was made, the message, permission to continue is granted, is projected on the goggle. Then, another, working, message is projected, indicating that his science class was about to begin. After a few seconds, Mr. Einstein greeted him, how are you doing? I am having a great and wonderful morning next to this detestable machine. Quote, I am glad that you are having a great and wonderful morning. Detestable, is not an acceptable word in our school. Are you feeling better now? I am feeling better. I apologize for my attitude. Please, do not give me extra work. Quote, apology accepted. Let us begin your trip to our natural satellite. What is it? I believe that you are referring to the lovely moon which has inspired me many poems. Quote, correct Baron, you said moon. Now, set the speed of the flying vehicle. All Funchio teachers were complex software programs created to interact intelligently with students almost like a human being. Practically, students could ask any question, and the Funchio teacher could respond accordingly. If the Funchio teacher could not answer the question, the teacher would say, please, rephrase the question. Often, Baron omitted asking questions that were too deep, because he knew that the Funchio teachers had been programmed just to deal with the restrictive government standards for education, and questions that fell outside those standards were answered by Funchio teachers with, relevant question. Please, ask another question. Furthermore, Funchio teachers could detect positive or negative attitude by a nauseating statistical analysis of the words that were being used by students. Negative attitude was punished by the Funchio teacher by giving students tedious writing tasks or making the verbally defiant students talk for several minutes after Funchio school was over with a Funchio counselor. Baron continued, without persistent excitement, interacting with the physics functio teacher for an hour, always giving the correct response for every question made by the teacher, who asked inadvertent comprehension questions to see if he was following the instruction. The level of physics he was taking was too elementary for Baron. Occasionally, he could not help expressing his negative attitude towards physics and had to apologize to Mr. Einstein for inappropriate use of words. It was more difficult for Baron to hold his mouth from saying inappropriate things during physics time than getting a good grade in the class. He was excellent in physics, however, given his desire to become a poet, he did not see much use for physics in his future professional life. Baron had been living in a world of metaphors ever since he had been writing reading, and thinking about poetry in his spare time. In Baron's view, physics and poetry were anathemas. On the other hand, what irked Baron the most about taking physics in such a mechanized way was that he believed it was unnecessary to be following Mr. Einstein's instruction in order to be able to do well on the test that he would take later. He often said to himself, it was too much work just to learn something that he thought was too simple. 
For Baron, one hour of physics was an hour of torture feeling that he could learn the material at his own pace if he did not have to be tied down to an authoritarian device. Without a break, after his physics class, the English seminar began, it was Baron's favorite class. As the Funchio teacher was making her appearance, he felt that he was ascending from the pits of hell into the clouds of heaven. In fact, he liked the subject so much that he was taking an advanced university course. The Funchio teacher was named Mr. Shakespeare, who was a candid, warm-hearted, emotional Funchio teacher, who was created to make the students feel deep emotions in order to inspire students to write. Baron was moved every time he read passages from books, he was programmed, based on years of research, to show facial expressions that incited emotions on students. After Mr. Shakespeare had greeted the class, he opened a book and said, Today, I will be reading a poem called, The True Call of Nature, by Wilfred Morgan. For several minutes, Mr. Shakespeare enchanted Baron, with his melodious voice, and contagious facial expressions, while he was reading the poem with so much passion that Baron thought, it is talking to my heart, making Baron release a little tear, which rolled down Baron's smooth light brown cheek, which ended up on his desk. After he finished reading, Baron was asked to write his response to the reading, he was eager to express all the emotions and poured out his heart on a wonderful short essay which was supposed to be done within 15 minutes. Once he was done with the English seminar, the math class began. He was an advanced student in math, but not at the university level because he wanted to take it easy. In a snap of fingers, Mr. Shakespeare disappeared. Then, Mr. Gauss was projected. Hello, Baron. Are you ready? Um, why not? Quote, okay. Let's begin. Then, Mr. Gauss began to lecture while Baron was trying to show clear signs that he was trying to pay attention because he knew Mr. Gauss loved to ask questions when his eyes were blinking too much. After a few minutes, Baron felt something in his eye and touched it quickly with his finger. At that moment, Mr. Gauss stopped lecturing and said, Is there something wrong? I have something in my eye. Quote, the problem is, the eye. Quote, suddenly a red box was projected that said, Is this a disability medical condition? Yes, no. Baron said, No, and Mr. Gauss was projected again. In order to see if Baron had been paying attention, Mr. Gauss was scratching his head and asked, what was the last thing I was talking about? Ah, the integral in x, y, z coordinates had to be transformed to u, b, and t coordinates. Quote, correct, let's continue. While he was listening to Mr. Gauss lecture on the method to perform a coordinate transformation using a determinant, he was thinking, I am entering Dante's Inferno, and I am already in the last circle. Then, a mathematics history note was projected about the life of a mathematician whose work was related to the lecture, it was a two-minute clip. After the clip, a message was projected. Are you ready for quiz? Yes, no. Oh yes. Replayed Baron, being certain that it was going to be easy. Then, the pop questions came out, and he had to select the right choice. Without much effort, he quickly made his choices for the 10 questions by saying the correct response to the VRS. Once the quiz was done, the virtual image was blank. After three seconds, Mr. Gauss responded, you are correct. Then, Mr. Gauss kept lecturing, while Baron was struggling to keep his eyes opened enough, so that he was not asked unnecessary questions by Mr. Gauss. After the Funchio teacher bored Baron with math for an hour, it was time for lunch, the time when the CEF allowed Baron to open the refrigerator in his home. He quickly stood up once the break time sign was projected on the Funchio goggles, 
took off the goggles and gloves, and threw them on the desk hard enough to express his dysphoria. Eagerly, he walked to the kitchen to eat a heavenly sandwich his dad had left in the refrigerator. When he arrived, the all-powerful light on the refrigerator was turned on indicating to Baron that he could open it. A few times, when he was little, he had tried to open the door when the red light was turned on, and he was not successful obtaining anything out of it. He opened the refrigerator, and there were many metal boxes inside, one on top of the other, like a chest of drawers. The boxes were labeled. He opened the box labeled, school, by pressing the green button on the right side of it, then, he grabbed the 12-inch vegetable sandwich. He devoured it in the kitchen knowing that nobody in the CEF was going to make a big deal about his poor manners when they observed how he transformed briefly into a pig. After he had finally sucked his sandwich like a snake eating a mouse, and it was the time to be ready for the next somber class, he rushed back to his dungeon. As soon as he got there, he put on his functio goggles and sat next to his fastidious functionaden again so that it could verify his presence in the room. While the functio goggles were showing, wait for detection, sign, he grabbed the functio gloves by fumbling on the surface of the smooth desk through the area where he remembered he had left them. Once he found them, he put them on. Once his presence in the room was detected by the Functionaden using the prying ODF, the Functio teacher for the history class began to introduce the topic and asked questions to Baron. It was usual for the history class to begin with warm-up questions. After responding the dull questions, the Functio teacher, Mr. Hegel, began to lecture on the Industrial Revolution and the effects it had on the population, it was a lecture that Baron found interesting. For 20 minutes, Mr. Hegel discussed how machines increased production and drove people away from the fields into the cities. Then, Mr. Hegel asked Baron to write a paragraph about the relevance of the Industrial Revolution today. Baron thought for a minute about the given question, and began to speak to the Functionaden articulately, as if he was being interviewed on A.T. V. Show. As he spoke, the Functionaden was projecting Baron's sentences on the goggles. After he finished his paragraph using his voice, he said to the Functionaden, Submit response now. No edit. Quote. Then, Mr. Hegel continued lecturing. Before Mr. Hegel dismissed the class, Mr. Hegel said, if you would like have extra credit, I would like to present a list of topics. Submit your answer later today or early in the morning tomorrow. Excited about doing the extra credit, Baron browsed through the list of 20 topics. There was one that captured his attention, the year of the asteroid and the consequences. He was going to make sure to write an erudite paper given that he was a savant on the topic. After the history class was over, he began his classes on computer technology and software creation. He hated the two classes, but he managed to get always an A-plus in the electronic reports for his dad just like he did for the other classes. Finally, during the last hour of Functio school, he took a quiz for each one of the classes. As always, he obtained perfect scores in all his quizzes. After Baron had finished his quizzes, he took off his Functio goggles and gloves. Then, he grabbed an electronic notepad which was next to the educational Functionaden. He was going to pretend to do his assigned homework for the day on that notepad. From 4 p.m. to 4.45 p.m., it was considered to be homework time by law. During this time, Baron pretended to work independently on the homework in front of the ODF. However, it was unsupervised time because he could pretend to be doing something but not do anything. Anyone or anything that were analyzing the image from those ODFs in the rooms of students could not capture details about what the students were reading or writing. 
In this way, Baron often used this bureaucratic time to write and read poetry. For him, writing or reading poetry was a way to relax after a hebetudinous functio school day. Thus, not thinking about how to manage his time, he often did his homework at night, when the ODF was technically turned off, and he was, presumably, under full supervision of his hard-working father. Usually, Baron did not feel like doing what he considered real thinking when he had to do it in front of a nosy ODF. Baron was anxiously waiting for 5 p.m. It was the time when he could go out of his house. Asterisk, asterisk, chapter E, asterisk, asterisk. From 5 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. were the adored, allowed hours for all the unlucky, Underage youngsters, it was a time when minors could go unfettered outside their homes without being arrested. Anxiously, at 4.46 p.m., after finishing the last line of his poem, Baron stood up and stretched. Then, he began to do jumping jacks in order to warm up for a delightful stroll, which he was going to do on the clean, light gray, pavement outside, which was waiting desperately for him. As he often did whenever he was inspired to record his original thoughts, he grabbed his beloved voice recorder, a one square inch by one tenth of an inch device from one of the three drawers of the shiny metallic bureau next to his bed, connected it to the TRS by placing the device inside a one square inch space on his right shoulder and, at exactly 5 p.m., like a race horse, he ran from his dull room to the door of his house feeling free again. Trying not to show his excitement, he gently opened the door, felt the humid fresh air for a second, and joyfully walked out of his house, with the twofold intention of carrying out his medically required cardiovascular walk, and heading towards the enchanting and beautiful park to meet with his beloved friends. While he was walking out of the black, metallic, front gate, which was 15 feet from the front door, he was paying attention to all the quirky social subtleties and idiosyncrasies of the unchained students that were coming out of their houses, and he found amusing what he was observing. They looked as if they had just woken up from a long sleep. Their irritated eyes were sensitive to the daylight. Their faces had no expression. Their body coordination seemed poor after being mostly sedentary for several hours. Baron often joked about this moment calling it the hour of the resurrection when he was trying to chat casually with students that were passing by. It was a joke that often made students walk away from him. While he was walking, he noticed that the sky was glooming and his TRS showed that it was 82 degrees Fahrenheit outdoors a temperature that the automatic regulator could lower to a more comfortable temperature of 74 degrees Fahrenheit inside his TRS. When he was already half a block away from his suffocating home, he said to the servo voice recorder on his TRS, activate and begin to record. Immediately, a visible red light turned on in the convenient chest area of his TRS indicating to anyone passing by that he was going to be having a functio communication. It was a way to tell bothersome teenagers passing by that he was not available to socialize. Then, he began to record his soft voice with an enraged tone while he was walking slowly towards the beautiful park that was just seven blocks away. I am sick of spending most of my day interacting with inanimate objects. I am a 16-year-old teenager, living in South Truxes, with perfect scores on all my standardized tests, with an impeccable discipline record, dreaming about living in the fields away from any functionat and guided system. I consider nature to be the anathema of technology, a disguised theme that I have discovered through my intense self-study of romantic poets. What makes functionatins worse is that everywhere I interact with an electronic device more than people, oh. 
Look at that, right now I am seeing teenagers sending messages to one another instead of speaking to one another. I am worked at the poor socialization skills that people display, for instance, the students, parade, on the streets during the allowed hours in perfect straight lines, they look like their heads are on the clouds, they do not greet each other, they seem that they only react to the lights and messages on the TRSs, they do not make eye contact even boyfriends and girlfriends do not display much affection and look at each other for several minutes before uttering some ridiculous line. I blame our Functionmaden world, because Functionmadens perform only what is practically required. It is not necessary to be friendly, polite, funny, sarcastic, or witty to maximize one's opportunities in life as it was during the last century. End of paragraph. I am mesmerized by romantic poetry. Often, I like to close my eyes and recite my favorite poem before going to sleep. In my mind, I can form a perfect world where I can escape any interaction with the functionmatons of my life. In my imagination, I love to be in a forest in the middle of the day when the sun illuminates everything, hearing the birds chirping, on a bed of grass, and smelling the humidity that fills the air. I know it is a quixotic idea, but I think it is the morally right way to let humans flourish because I am a slave of cybernetic laws and those laws have no compassion for my personal views. Asterisk 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 asterisk. It was not surprising that Baron was treated as a strange neighbor by shallow teenagers around his block for his unusual perspectives about life. Baron was trying always to engage in intellectual conversation which contrasted with the pragmatic tendencies that students had been learning from their effective functio instructors. Most of the students in Baron's neighborhood valued education for the practical consequences that were entailed by it, Thus, most of them did not understand Baron's aversion towards functionmatons, which he often tried to denigrate with expressions such as, the evil instruments of nature's destruction, which he often uttered casually around teenagers during his failed attempts to hold a conversation. The main reason why Baron's young acquaintances around his neighborhood were not pleased to interact with Baron was that he was a non-libidinous person. In the hedonist ambience of Truxes, teenagers living in Baron's neighborhood could not understand someone like Baron who had no desire at all to be physically intimate with someone else. He neither had the ability to fall in love nor wanted to please himself physically even though he was physiologically correct. He had no cognitive disorders. He did not have any well-known syndromes. Simply stated, Baron had a non-libidinous identity. Baron's non-libidinous identity greatly contrasted with the libidinous identity of most of the people around his neighborhood. They were mostly interested in meeting someone so that they could be physically intimate in the future. Much of what libidinous teenagers talked and did were projections of their desires for physical intimacy. Given that teenagers in the Truxes area were carefully monitored by adults at all moments via technology, libidinous teenagers could only talk about physical intimacy and share verbally what they wanted from a partner in their adult, unsupervised future. However, sometimes, around his block, teenagers heard stories about pairs of teenagers that had run away because they were in love and were found later that day by the police. In contrast, Baron was not preoccupied about finding a partner. His focus was deeply academic and often dismissed conversations about vulgar physical pleasure. When he talked with libidinous students during the allowed hour, not being able to understand the need they had to share their bodies with someone else just for pleasure. For Baron, the idea was as ridiculous as it was for a libidinous person to see. Two people tickling each other noses just to induce a sneeze, it was a thought he did not want to share with anyone. 
Baron's lack of emotional connection with physically intimate topics, which seemed like an obsession for repressed teenagers from the point of view of Baron, most of the teenagers in his neighborhood, was reciprocated negatively by libidinous teenagers. Many teenagers scorned the fact that Baron claimed not to have physical attraction towards anything or anybody. The derogatory term used by teenagers to harass him was, empty doll. Obviously, given the strict electronic surveillance everywhere, such a term was not openly uttered. It was whispered occasionally in Baron's ear when some bully walked closed by. All the subtle harassment resulted in Baron's social isolation from teenagers groups formed around his neighborhood during the allowed hours. On the other hand, Baron did not care much about being socially isolated from the majority of those shallow students. In order to be able to socialize tastefully, he had the original idea of forming a group for non-libidinous teenagers. With the magnificent help of Funchio communication, Baron had been able to find only three bright, openly non-libidinous students living around his dishonorable neighborhood. Baron had named his faithful group the Proud Zeros, having been inspired by an old punk rock song he had heard from a device called iPod, which had belonged to his father. Soon after they had met, the group of four members became their own social world. The group of four worked together efficiently. In tune with Baron's love for beautiful natural settings, the four members used to meet in an enchanting park during the allowed hours for 40 minutes. They constantly talked about postmodern philosophers who had been questioning the role of gender in shaping the human thought. Also, they discussed ways to educate the majority about what it meant to be non-libidinous. A frequent activity carried out by the clever group was to pass out informational functio storage units to open-minded teenagers walking by the park, about what is entailed by the possession of the eccentric non-libidinous identity. It was unusual for people to do this due to wireless functio communications. On the other hand, it was clever to be doing such thing at the park. In addition, they were open to talk to teenagers about their amusing group and their quirky non-libidinous identity whenever any curious person wanted to know about them. The group of four was more than just a group of people with whom they could share intellectual thoughts about gender and physical intimacy. For all of them, the unusual group meant an extension of a family where they could have close and loving friends who accepted them for what they were. They often held hands while they were in their meetings to make prayers to nature about things that they wished happened in the world and without feeling inhibited to express their love for one another in words. They love each other so much that they acted as one entity, where the group was the body and Baron was the mind. Just like Baron, the other three students from the Proud Zeros Club were as interested in academic knowledge as Baron was. One of them was Mary, a shy, sensitive, nervous girl, who was also 16 years of age, like young Baron, and who liked reading romantic poetry like Baron did. They often wrote poems to one another. Another member of the Proud Zeros Club was the 16-year-old Martin who was outspoken and interested in politics. The most quiet from all of them was Carl who often did not want to challenge any of the other three members whenever he disagreed with someone's policy, but was deeply interested in discussing scientific topic. It was only about science that he liked to talk about. Nevertheless, Baron was the smartest from all the group indisputably given that he was classified as more than a genius by the Funchio school. He was already taking upper-level courses at the university level at that age of 16. It was obvious for the other members of the group to recognize that he was the smartest given the amazing knowledge that he had about every topic mentioned by the other students. In fact, the other members affectionately nicknamed him the Funchio Encyclopedia behind his back. 
On the other hand, regardless of their intelligence, they were all excellent students and shared the love for academic learning. Although they were enchanted to be learning about school subjects themselves, just like Baron, they all were worked by the means that were institutionalized in order for them to be able to learn academics' knowledge daily, they all detested learning from functionatins. In this way, the Proud Zeros Club was also the place to learn, in their view, from human to human. Their reunions in the park were vicarious ways to learn as if they were in an old-fashioned school. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. At 5.16 p.m., beams of light filtering through the grayish clouds were beginning to illuminate everything, and Baron was arriving at the park, where he was going to assemble with other members of the Proud Zeros Club. From the corner, he was able to see ahead the shiny green grass, the colorful flowers, and hear the sounds made by the birds. While he was walking on the ivory-colored path that was in the middle of the gigantic park, he was moving his head from side to side in order to contemplate and enjoy the beauty of the artificial nature that was surrounding him. It was rare during the year 2054 to see trees on the sidewalks of South Truxes. Then, he crossed the small, brown, wooden bridge that helped people go across the small elongated and turbid lagoon, which was in the center of the park. Many romantic words came to Baron's mind, watching the white ducks bask in the sun, while he was crossing that, fairy tale, looking bridge. Once on he arrived to the other side of the lagoon, he looked at the concrete bench where they usually held their lively meetings and noticed that Carl, Mary, and Martin were already waiting for him sitting on it. Martin noticed first that he was arriving and said, here comes the boss, pointing with his index finger in the direction Baron was coming. Putting both hands around his mouth to do the megaphone effect, Martin said, we were going to start without you. Baron chuckled and kept on striding without responding anything, thinking about a good excuse for being late, however, he could not think of any believable excuse. When he was close enough to the bench, he said truthfully, I walked slowly for a few minutes because I was using my voice recorder. Quote, because Mary often did the same, she responded to Baron, you have my pardon. Then, she giggled. With a smile on his face, Martin said to Baron, So, what is the agenda for today? Then, Baron, standing up in front of them, said from memory the agenda for discussion for that day while the other teenagers were just sitting on the bench listening like obedient pets. The first thing that Baron brought to their attention was that they needed to find more possible members for their club. Martin seemed to be full of original ideas about it. He suggested finding a way to talk to parents that were suspicious about the identity of their youngsters instead of approaching doubtful teenagers. Also, he mentioned that if the Proud Zeros Club could make a trip to the legislature chambers in order to push the mighty federal government of USA to extend the definition of sexual orientation so that the definition also means non-libidinal, the media would advertise their obscure club at no cost, and they could get a lot of attention around the world. Martin also said that they should organize pride parties at non-traditional churches in the community. Martin explained that, after all, non-libidinal orientation was not even theologically inconsistent with the most traditional church teachings. After Martin presented his witty ideas, nobody else dared to add anything to the brilliant suggestions that Martin mentioned because the others were not able to come up with ideas that surpassed his. After nobody had anything else to say about the first point of discussion, they began to discuss the second item in Baron's agenda. The next thing they had to do was to thoroughly share information about any interesting books, mildly related to their conception of the non-libidinal identity, 
Written before last century, it was something that Baron passionately had asked them to research in their previous meeting. The first brave person that shared his research was Carl. In his phlegmatic tone of voice, he mentioned some esoteric books on Stoic philosophy 12 and explained their relation with non-libidinous identity. They were all bored. After Carl finished expounding thoroughly on Stoic philosophy, Mary expounded upon the well-known Immanuel Kant's philosophy 13 and its connection with sexuality. Being an eloquent speaker, she made everyone open their brown eyes widely. She had awakened their dormant souls. It was not the content that brought up the magic but her presentation with simple words. Then, after Mary interpreted how reason, is an inevitable part of human identity, nullifies libido when making conscientious moral decisions. 14. Martin briefly suggested that the New Testament from the Bible, as he had implied in the previous point of discussion, could be interpreted as a pursuit of non-libidinal identity for those unfortunate humans that were born with an untamed libidinal identity. Once everyone shared the titles and authors of those old books that they had meticulously researched, and the extravagant reasons why they believed the books belonged to the non-libidinal genre, Baron jubilantly wanted to share a scanty manuscript that he had been arduously writing for several months. It was typical of Baron to use entertaining stories instead of creating unfathomable arguments, valuing discussion with pleasant literary devices rather than miserable, logical arguments. From Baron's genius point of view, enlightened creativity could trigger critical thinking and analysis as much as grudging knowledge grown out of logic. In this way, Baron often avoided any sultry arguments whenever anyone from the group wanted to challenge his amazing perspective on things, resorting to tasteful fiction, in the form of poetry or allegorical stories, to move his audience to reflect. With the intention to make the teenagers reflect about the shady sociology of gender, Baron said, I am going to share a mini-fiction story that I wrote about a socially isolated boy whose life was manipulated by his parents since birth. Quote, Excited, Martin responded, Oh, that is a good story. Read it. Carl, finding whatever Baron extemporaneously did acceptable, said, Let's hear it. Quote, it sounds scary, read it, Mary said, convinced that the story that Baron was going to read was going to make a lasting impression on her. With a tone of excitement, observing how willing all of them were to listen to him, Baron unfolded the neatly folded paper and proceeded to read. The fictitious story was about a boy whose life was monitored every day and every night by functionaries to make sure he did not touch himself in any way. His life was part of a secret scientific experiment where the boy was the only one that did not know that everything around him was a deliberate setup. Baron told them that the boy grew up in an island where only his dad, mom, and two older siblings lived. Then, when the boy became a teenager, their parents tried to explain to him what was happening to his body without encouraging him to form fantasies about his body. In this way, his parents only taught him biology and not reproduction education. His parents deliberately tried to reduce biology to chemistry and physics as much as possible in order to avoid discussing biological functions too much. Once the boy became 21, he was sent to the city of Truxes where he was going to meet with a 21-year-old boy and girl that also was 21 years, who were going to be his guides through the city. As his guides, they were going to explain to him what adults do with other adults intimately and encourage him to do the same. Baron paused, looked at them, and asked, Okay, what do you think is going to happen? Mary immediately said, Oh, I think that he is going to be a non-libidinal person. Carl, being scientifically oriented, said, That is a good hypothesis. 
However, a real sociological experiment requires a large sample of individuals in order to arrive to a conclusion. Martin, agreeing with Carl, said, yeah. I think that if we carry out the experiment with many boys and girls we would find out that a great majority of them are going to become non-libidinous. And Martin continued intensely expounding with daunting statistical language the way to quantify the clever thought experiment suggested by Barron's story and the results from it. After speaking with somber statistical language, Martin expounded upon his theory about how libidinous identity is developed with the intention to contrast his theory with the thought experiment. In this way, Martin effectively transformed Barron's vague imagination into science. After they orderly finished discussing Barron's story, it was time for making random announcements. Carl stood up and said with the tone of voice of a preacher, I would like to announce that my birthday will be next week. You are all invited to my house. Gladly, they all thanked Carl and promptly confirmed that they were going to his celebratory party. Then, Baron said, anyone else? No. Okay. We can all go now. Carl and Mary stood up hastily from the uncomfortable bench, stretched, and walked together side by side towards the little bridge that allowed them to go across the park's lagoon as a yellow band on the horizon indicated that the sun was setting. Martin, unexplainably, remained comfortably seated on the hard bench while Baron was pretending to look at Carl and Mary walk away, noticing something strange. Then, Martin suspiciously stood up walked towards Baron and gave his hand in order to say goodbye. When Baron lifted his hand to reciprocate the action, he noticed that there was a small folded piece of old-fashioned paper between Martin's fingers. Paper was not used as much, which Baron unhesitatingly pulled to his hand with dexterity when he held Martin's hand with discretion, in order to make the action look like a simple handshake. Unexpectedly, Martin hugged Baron with his other hand, pulled him so that he was closer, and whispered in his ear, read the information in that paper. It is top secret, then, quickly, Martin walked away. Baron just put the cryptic paper discreetly in his termosuit bag in order to make sure the omniscient ODFs that were all over the park did not catch the transaction. Baron waited until Martin was out of sight in order to start rushing towards home. Once Martin was gone, he dashed off the park in order to get home and figure out there by reading the little enigmatic paper the secret that Martin had mentioned. Once Baron was at home, he walked straight to his room in order to find out what the folded paper was all about. Fortunately, his dad had not arrived yet from work. Once in the privacy of his room, there were no ODFs supervising anything during the time. He sat down, inserted his hand into his TRS bag, and pulled the folded paper. He unfolded the mysterious paper with desperation and noticed that it was an artful pamphlet. The pamphlet said, Join as human warriors against the machine. It is time to let humans be reborn again. Do not let a functionaden run your life. It is time to free of ourselves from the technology prison we have built for ourselves. If you are interested, join us at the old jazz corner at 6.20 p.m. Quote. Astonished, Baron remained with his mouth open for three minutes trying to process what he had read. Then, he realized that it was amazing. It was unheard in the United States. Amazingly, it was just what Baron wanted. Then, he looked at the clock, it was 6.09 p.m. He figured that if he ran, he could be there on time. Immediately, he inserted the paper in the TRS bag again and ran outside heading towards the old jazz corner.